Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks to the library for um, sponsoring this with us, giving us the room, which is so nice, as always. And thanks to the administration and the BOE and government officials and all the parents who came out on a non-meeting night for a meeting. It was nice in the rain. And um, so we just wanted to tell you about two upcoming C uh, CPAC programs that are, the handout is on the table when you go back out again, if you missed it. There's two on anxiety, um, both in January, and um, one with the Child Mind Institute, which was really popular in the past, and another one with um, Dr. McAllister, who's um, a physician here in Stanford, actually, or in Stanford. And um, tomorrow we have the DHS uh, Parents Association is doing a uh, pr program called Digital Tools and Universal Access. So it's tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in the Darien Board of Ed building. And um, you can learn about how, how technology levels the playing field for all. And they're going to discuss how accessibility and adaptive technology can reduce frustration and facilitate learning for um, Karen, uh, kids and parents, too. And um, now um, uh, Janie's going to explain the format for us. Uh, thank you. Um, Superintendent Adley and Board of Finance Chairman uh, John Zabrowski for joining us this evening. Um, we did send a list of questions out, but this is also um, the purpose is to allow parents um, to ask questions before the budget process and uh, before the state of the town address. So while we'd like to go through some of those that we sent to the two of you, we'd also like to leave time to allow everyone to answer or ask questions that they have. And part of you distributed cards, is that correct? There are index cards on the back. So if anybody table. wants to do that uh, through a card, they're on the table or in the right. Okay. Being taken. Great. So um, is it okay with the two of you if we go through in the order that sure. we have? Yeah. Okay. So um, the first uh, question that we have, or the topic, is um, <coughs> district tracking of delivered special education services. Um, it's been uh, a question, um, what method we're using to track the delivery of the services, and if the method differs between um, when excess cost reimbursement is expected, um, how is it impactful in the budget, to the budget process, but also um, how are parents being um, notified of missed sessions, um, and how are they involved in the delivery of their the special education services to their student? I guess I'll start off. I, I did want to thank uh, CPAC for organizing this session. Uh, special education is an important topic for this town, certainly something that I've been involved in uh, tangentially, not as part of the Board of Education for a long time. I was noting that the presentation that I gave in response to Sue Gam's report, the state of the town from um, from the audit report that I did, special education audit update, November 19th, 2014. So tomorrow, if everyone has a little party, we get a five-year <laughs> um, anniversary celebration of that uh, of that happy day. So uh, anyway, like I said, we're, we're very happy to be here. I think a number of the questions that have been posed here are pretty specific in terms of the mechanics around how special education is tracked in town. I know Dr. Adley will have some comments on that, but of course these are all pretty sensitive issues in terms of how we address them and the need for not just accuracy and, and, and management of that, uh, but discretion and, and confidentiality given the cases and the students involved. So we take that certainly as an outsider, I take that very seriously. It was a major issue even touching on some of this when we did the special education audit. Uh, and so again, we uh, uh, we looked at this with great seriousness for quite a while. Uh, Dr. Hadley? Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to accompany John, John for the for this particular meeting. If I may just uh, introduce one of my staff members, I think you know, uh, Assistant Superintendent Klein. Mm -hmm. uh, Shirley's the Assistant Superintendent for Special Education. Um, and upon receiving the, the invitation, I'm glad to be here, but I'm also, when I look at the questions and so on, um, certainly as a new superintendent, um, I'm actually interested in your perspective sometimes on why you're asking those questions, right? Uh, that will help provide color for me a little bit um, and sort of uh, fill, fill in the jigsaw pieces. It'll help me uh, fit those pieces together um, and understand kind of the origin of the questions. And for the most part, I think I, I get a sense, but um, at some points throughout the evening, perhaps if I can get your perspective, it's okay, so why do you ask that? Because uh, uh, that would help me probably understand 
what constituents are concerned about, looking for, so on and so forth. Um, the delivery for, for special education, I have to tell you, I'm very, very impressed uh, with the delivery and also the recording of it, and that's one of these sort of questions. Um, I mean, I don't need to tell you as special education parents, your IEPs, uh, uh, they are on IEP Direct. That's, that's, a, that's the software that we use. Um, and for the most part, we have uh, dual systems, uh, one for tracking excess cost, uh, which is extremely well detailed. I want to tell you something. Uh, I haven't seen a district, I mean, as, as detailed in its collection of information of special services. Uh, for, for those uh, cases, or for one of a better term, that are not excess costs, uh, essentially they're tracked through uh, the caseworkers in terms of are the students present, uh, are they getting the delivery of services? But there is a second service that sort of ties in and works uh, in tangent with uh, IEP Direct uh, for the uh, excess cost, which is pretty significant, as you know. Uh, so it's, there's a lot of uh, uh, record keeping essentially needed for that particular process, and it's extremely detailed. So there's sort of two processes uh, that are going on simultaneously. Can you please tell us what excess cost means? So, uh, for for sorry. Thank you. I don't know. Really sorry. Uh, so, for uh, students who receive special services, uh, so in anything in excess of four and a half times the cost uh, for those particular services, uh, we, so we, we get re re reimbursed. Let's just round it out to about ninety thousand dollars. Right. So anything above ninety thousand dollars, we would get reimbursed. It's meant to be at 100%, but the state never funds it at 100%, so it's anywhere from 73, 74, 75, depending. So you'll get 70, basically anything above like 90,000, theoretically, you get about 75 uh, cents back on dollar. That's basically. You'll, you'll hear confusing acronyms, so you'll hear <coughs> ECR, which is Excess Cost Reimbursement. There's actually another source of funding the town gets, which is called ECS, which is Education Cost Sharing. That's a different source of funding from the state and that's based uh, it's basically what it says which is the state uh, makes resources available to individual towns if you look at towns like Hartford and Bridgeport their education cost sharing numbers are in the many many millions of dollars it's a much bigger deal for them <clears throat> for us it's much smaller and actually for a few years depending on the state as we were looking at the state's finances we actually conservatively decided to budget for that for, for zero it's just a few hundred thousand dollars but we continue to get some share of that <clears throat> excess cost reimbursement, which is for the specific cases Dr. Adley refers to, is a much bigger number, and that's something that, to answer this sort of second question here, how's the excess cost tracking impact, impactful to the budget process? So that detailed work that the Board of Education and the administration keeps on those cases, that then feeds into an estimate where they're estimating not just the amount of expenditure that's above that four and a half times threshold that Dr. Adley mentioned, but also the, an estimate of the percentage reimbursement that we would get for those cases. It's been averaging 72, 73 yeah, percent, something thereabouts. like that, thereabouts. So that's the math that then feeds into the budget process, which the Board of Finance then takes into account for sort of estimating, if you will, what we should budget for those uh, for those reimbursements. So anything under the four and a half times would be within the town budget and not for any reimbursement? Correct. Yeah, yep. So you can be right on the threshold or either side of it. Okay. And that's perfectly cool based on whatever their situation would be. Well, the per pupil is calculated uh, based on what it costs uh, to educate a student here in Darien or any other. So it's, that's, that's released every year by the state. <clears throat> yeah, that 90,000 figures expenditures divided by the number of students, it gives us an average number. And so that average number, call it 20,000 or so times four and a half get you to 90,000. And so that's the threshold at which expenditures above that amount start are qualified for a reimbursement. Expenditures below that amount for an individual student are not. Don't quote me on the 90. I use that as a round figure just because. <laughs> yeah. I'm quoting him on the 90. <laughs> Thank you. How do you determine if a, um, a student's cost is nearing where they uh, the services would um, qualify to use a different tracking system to switch from the, the service provider to um, the, the um, software. I'm not sure what the name of it is. You mentioned IEP Direct. 
Uh, well, IEP Direct is what what all students and special services are recorded on. Okay. Um, but if you're talking about it kicks into the excess cost. Um, so essentially, we have to you have to sort of go over that tipping point before. If, if, I mean, because the, there are some projections that are made that, that it, it could cost this or a, a particular amount. Uh, in that case, you you would you would. Uh, You'll be utilizing that surface as soon as as soon as you sort of trigger it. Uh, sure, Shirley, is that a correct answer? Or if I may just add that, yeah. so when we look at we do have our students, so we know how costs very often we'll know if students are um, have high cost related services or contracted services. We monitor those. We know that we make invoices on them, so we were able to really um, not only assess which students we fall into that, but we look at it twice a year. We look at the December one threshold, and we look at the March one threshold. So we have an idea that those students are based on the related services they're receiving. Um, we also know that within, um, if they're in smaller instructional models, which have smaller ratios of classes and different services, we know who our students are in those specialized programs as well. Yes, ma'am. For those of us who met with you five years ago or the agency that was handling excess costs and tracking, there were a lot of questions about um, whether all the services were received and if the data was recorded correctly in terms of how much, how much um, if their IEP was being followed and they received all the services. Do you find that in the past five years that system has improved, that people are receiving the services, that people are making up what hasn't been provided, and so forth? Uh, that's an excellent question, <clears throat> and one of the things I want to remind everybody is that the nature of the audit report that the Board of Finance chartered and that I led was to focus on the financial aspects of that. In fact, I was reading rereading this slide uh, earlier today, and I actually want to highlight exactly what I said there to, to make sure that there's a, a split in your mind on these two topics. So. The, the audit itself was really, as I said, focused on the financial aspects, and those aspects are um, these areas. One is documentation of services delivered and whether that was accurate and complete, um, uh, whether the services were delivered as claimed or uh, allocated incorrectly, and then finally, whether the costs of the services that were delivered um, uh, were calculated properly. Okay, so what we specifically didn't focus on, because as a board of finance, it was completely outside our purview, was whether IEPs were improperly or illegally modified, or whether promised services were not delivered, or whether the services were delivered, but in a manner not consistent with the IEP. So if you think about it, th th those are really issues that are not financial in nature. It's tied to the financial aspects of it. But it's one thing to say, did my child actually get this service from this individual with these qualifications at this time and in this manner, right? That's a whole set of questions that have no numbers attached to them. It's a qualitative assessment, right? What we looked for at the end was, well, does the paperwork that was submitted to the state, right, is that accurate and complete, and does that conform to the rules that this, the state specifies for documentation in order to receive these reimbursements? And that, that actually was the piece of it, given the financial nature of our board, that we focused on. So I was very clear in that audit that I didn't want to touch on, and frankly was outside my purview, to touch on any aspect of whether the, the services themselves were delivered. I recognize that they're related. Um, that said, I can concur with what Dr. Adley says. There's been a significant improvement in this, and Dr. Klein would, I think, corroborate this, and it's in the following areas. One is uh, simply training, right? One of the things we cited in all this was that there had been a lack of training with some of the individuals who were responsible for all this, and I think that's, by and large, been not just corrected, but very much corrected. They've taken that very seriously. The second piece of it was merely documentation and processes around some of this, right? So that some of the documents and the way they were collected and even forms filled out that were done in an inconsistent manner. That was also something that we'd noticed. And again, from everyone I've talked to over the years since this audit was done, that that's been changed and improved substantially. Uh, but the one caveat that I would have with this is that 
there's a point in diminishing retur- of diminishing returns when you improve accuracy on something like this, right? The last few percentage points to get this down to the last detail is extraordinarily hard to do and cost prohibitive in a way uh, to actually assemble the clerical resources to, to get that level of precision, especially when sometimes the services are delivered in groups or sometimes the services are uh, altered in such a way that doesn't violate the IEP but changes the way it's accounted for. Just makes 100% accuracy extremely difficult. But in my judgment, the threshold that they've met in terms of the investments on training, process, procedure, forms, and verification once all that's been completed. I've talked to quite a number of people over a number of years, and in my judgment, based on the nature of this audit and Sue Gam's report, I'm satisfied with what I see. So the level of detail of recording uh, services is pretty impressive. Um, and for, for excess costs, they are recorded and submitted weekly or monthly, um, or sometime during that particular period. Uh, I will say that for parents who receive special services, your first and always your uh, well, responsibility option, whatever way you would like to describe it, is at that PPT uh, in terms of are the services being delivered or not. I mean, that's really uh, where you should record that. Um, it's really where your, your voice is. Um, and that was, that's, that's where I would look to see our parents receiving their, their children are they receiving the service that are on the IP? Uh, that, that's that's your main way of, of seeking clarification on that. But I haven't seen anything uh, today to suggest that uh, uh, we're not delivering service. In fact, I see the opposite uh, for the level of detail and implementation. So was that it on district tracking of special education services, Jamie? Anything else we wanted to cover there? Or anyone else have any um, questions on it? Are we going to the next topic? Just one last follow-up. Um, Please. Does, is the district notifying parents that have missed sessions, when sessions are missed, and if they've been made uh, prior to the end of the school year or the end of the summer? So let me try and see if it, I would be expecting the caseworker to be overseeing that and if, if there are missed sessions we'll be making those up we've had a discussion about that but I'll, I'll just clarify am I correct on that the case manager is responsible um, some parents some families have communication logs they do it that way um, sometimes it's done by email sometimes it is done um, by phone call but yes the case manager the case um, the case manager is really the person to speak to um, if and again I'm without talking about children and specific information um, most families in fact I'd like to say all families who have a close relationship with case managers um, uh, weekly or monthly on the secondary level, there are bi monthly phone calls that happen, so that's just one that way on middle sex and high school. On the elementary level, we have sex facilitators. Their responsibility is to have four best efforts in addition to case managers. It's certainly not unusual to have disruptions during the day, whether they're design disruptions like schedule changes or so on and so forth, but there has to be every reasonable effort to make those delivery of services up. And there should be. Okay, what's next? Yeah, we should move on. Um, uh, does this gentleman have a... Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Second. Please. So, so after the Sue Gam report came out, um, I believe we did sort of an interim there, and they put in place something called Easy Track. Yes, sir. Which was, which was designed to help the parents track what the services were they were getting. Um, that was removed pretty quickly um, when Dan Brenner got here. Can you speak to Easy Track? Whether that would be something that's helpful, I'd be beyond IEP directly, but whether that would be helpful, or was that redundant, or how does that make? Uh, so the limited, limited amount that I know about that, I think your your summation is correct. It was in place at the time, and uh, it became apparent that that was not sort of integrated with IEP direct, and it was actually more convoluted and, and more difficult uh, to align services. So hence they went to another system. Uh, to track the excess costs uh, that would work hand in hand with uh, the IEP or IEP direct try. So that you're right that that's not in place anymore because it did. I believe I don't have the minutes in front of me, but I believe that was reported to the board too. Um, that 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 we changed a, a particular service. May I add to that? Yeah. Um, 
Um, and it was when Dr. Brenner came up, as I mentioned, he told the board of this is what happened. Um, easy Track was a system that actually came out of Massachusetts. Um, it couldn't speak to IP direct, you really couldn't cross walk with them, so you couldn't really look at IPs cross walk if they were implementing services. Um, the district was gracious enough, we actually hired um, the person to come in, it's actually had a shape, um, who actually built up a system that really does cross walk with IP direct. Um, we actually brought in um, Easy Track originally and said, Can you make this happen? And they said, No, we can't. That's when we decided that there were going to be a system that would help us collect information accurately, that would comply with our audited needs, and we built our own system. And the system works efficiently and, um, and then some. So, just one comment. Yes. So, when the system was built, it was some of this, because you were asking, like, what's the impetus of it? Yeah, yes, yes, right? good, good, yes. And just to kind of get back to that, I know we're jumping ahead. That would be helpful to me, though. That would be helpful. But sort of, this, as I think a few people have alluded to, this kind of came about, you know, back in 2012. Yeah. But the recommendation at that time from the Sukam report was to do, um, data, to create a data system. Yes. Um, for, and my understanding, it was a data system for IEPs. Um, that would also track excess cost. So now it sounds a little bit like, um, I think at the time there was also a recommendation to create a desk, data system for 504s, you know, to really track service delivery. Um, so I guess I, I think that's where some of the, um, I, I think I'm still trying to understand is that, so now we have a system that tracks services for excess costs, but it's, it doesn't sound like it's a data system per se for all IEPs. That is really, we're relying on case managers. And, and I think, I think the, the, you know, some of the anxiety is yeah. that in the past, it didn't work so great. I mean, I think that there was a, there was a lot of feedback in that um, report that suggests that there's this element of human error. Don't get me wrong, I think we have wonderful case managers, we have amazing teachers, they are very busy and they are killing themselves for, for our kids many times. Um, I think it was just, I think that's where some of the impetus of the question came because it wasn't recommended that there be a data system tracking for, that was all services. All services. <clears throat> well, I can, I, no, I, I, can, I can understand that perspective. Um, I think, I don't want to over speculate or, or um, overstate something or understate something. I do think that, that the excess cost is particularly of the nature given given the service that are delivered, both internal, external, uh, the nature and the extent of them. Um, and that's, that's the level of detail that you would need. And I'm just wondering if any other districts do it. Like it, at the time, I think in fairness, sure. um, Sugam did work with bigger districts. So uh, maybe it's more of the nature of a bigger district, but I think the question, I guess I just wonder about is um, if any other districts do reporting um, electronically or if it's, if, it's, if it's done more the way we do it. I think you'll find us all over the board, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, I, can, I can certainly tell this group here that the level of detail that I've looked at I'm very impressed with, extremely impressed with, in terms of how things are being uh, tracked and the recording of it. It's, it. it's a tremendous level of detail. You're one of my board members. So, Courtney, I think you're asking an important question, and I'm glad to hear out of either. I think it's important idea. I think one of the things, though, when you're talking about making change to an organization, there's something called a triangle. There's three sides of the triangle are people, process, and technology. So we're talking about technology, which is a really critical part of it. But we also need to talk about people and processes. So a lot of work has gone into changing the processes that, and I'm sure you can speak to that, or Alan, much better than I. But also changing the people, putting in um, more, more administration, whether that's the, the um, department chair, special education, and secondary, and um, excuse me, middle school and the high school, um, taking a look at the training of our administrators for secondary and um, and elementary and how those are structured. So from here, I'll push it off to someone who can speak better. But I think it's important to understand that all three of those things interrelate and are fairly critical in making system-wide change. So Jill spoke perfectly about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will say this, Courtney, to answer your question also. It's precisely what Jill was saying, is building administrators are responsible to monitor the implementation of IPs. Uh, and we do have a level of our system principles and principles 
patients have to sign off knowing that service is being delivered. Uh, they have that as well. On the secondary level, we did bring in, as Joe said, our chairpersons to make sure we're doing that. So I think all hands are on deck. Uh, I think, um, although I appreciate the notion that monitoring things electronically has a value added piece, which is why we do that and need to do that for accounting purposes with our excess cost. But I think site supervision of all of the administrators that we have, and there's a very robust opportunity the board has approved for us, is really what shows implementation by these. Um, they're looking at it, they're committed to it. We do professional training, we brought in council also to make sure that it's it's implemented. And I can say with assurance, Courtney, and I hope this is the experience of, of anyone who's attending this evening also, that you are confident that your children are receiving the services and that the administrators and the providers are implementing them on them. And is that the leaders of all should know, so I think just sort of I think they help coordinate efforts with parents. So mm -hmm. although they're not tracking, I think they're really the liaison, which is why the board approved them. As a result of the 2013-14 experience, I think the notion is they should be go-to person for parents, you should be able to reach out to them. They will help coordinate efforts, but they won't be tracking them. I think sometimes they create blogs and they kind of work with communication onto the families also. But they're not the most responsible. Yes, ma'am. Um, Shirley, I think that you are correct that in most cases, the people that you have in place are doing doing everything to the best of their ability. But I think it really needs to be noted that some of the service providers that um, provide services at the middle school and high school, it's virtually impossible to put that person on a five-day schedule with an eight-day rotating schedule at the high school. And there are services that are not being provided some days, and life happens, but you're reporting that they are being provided, mm -hmm. and they're not. So I think we have to kind of tweak that because so I, I don't, I, I can say they're not being reported that they are not. We're saying that we know there are missed sessions. And we're saying one of the biggest opportunities for missed sessions are when there's QBT attendance. And we know that happens. But so then they should be making those up. Right, but no, and they are made up with not only with every effort, they are on a schedule to make them up and they do make them up. Um, it's actually designed and everyone has been trained in the district. The sessions that often that are not made up are based on student absence, but based on any other absence, whether it's PP attendance, whether it's a special event in the school, whether there's really that those are made up. So yes, they are made up in a timely manner. Sometimes it's not as timely as you like to be, and you're right. Servicing a five-day cycle, six-day cycle, eight-day cycle for related service providers, meaning OTPT and other is, is an incredible challenge. And the caseload. And the caseload. The caseload is a very big right. piece, and you have one service provider. And we can choose schools. But we do continue to meet that challenge, and, and, um, and we continue to make up those sessions. But I think it should be noted that they're not all made up. You do the best of your ability, but they are not all made up. That would be fair. So I just think in the spirit of transparency, we need to be transparent that we are working, like Jill said, it is a triangle, but there are missing links. There are. In the triangle. And there are provisions, but also sometimes it involves home uh, makeup, sometimes it involves school it's makeup. Absolutely. It's parent and provider. Absolutely. Not, it is both. But it, that's reasonable to say. I agree with that. I would just, uh, I would expect again that every reasonable effort is made to make sessions up and I don't know, what's your name, ma'am? Colleen. Lines. Colleen. I, I, I'm expecting, Colleen, that if it's, if it's your particular case or uh, your, your, your children or otherwise or someone else's, uh, that you just make that very explicitly known to the caseworker. But I hear you. Yeah, I'd actually like to call out your question as, as excellent. And the reason that it's an important point to make is that the way we ensure all these services get delivered uh, delivered is through a community effort, right? It's going to be Dr. Klein's group. It's going to be other administrators. It's going to be students reporting to their parents what happened at school that day. It's going to be parents listening to all that and then contacting the appropriate folks, whether it's the caseworker, someone who reviews the IEP, the principal, somebody like that. But when you attack it from all those angles, right, that's how actually these things get identified. So I'd actually interpret your comment as not to say, look, these services are not being delivered. It's really to remind, in addition, to remind everybody that everybody in this room that plays a role in making sure that these services are delivered consistent with what the IEP prescribes. So you're absolutely right. Yes, sir. Um, does the state have any kind of internal audit or compliance function that 
sort of checks things like the excess reimbursement from, from that side of things? Well, my understanding, again, this is uh, five years old, but at the time, my understanding is that the state reviews these applications uh, for reimbursement when they come in to check the, the applications themselves for accuracy. Whether they actually do audits on all of those applications, I don't know that. Uh, I do know that when we did the audit for that report, there was actually a reimbursement to the state for some of the costs that had been miscalculated, the processes for which were corrected later on. Uh, but that's how those discrepancies were surfaced in our case. I don't know that they have a regular audit function for those applications. I would be surprised if something like that did not exist, but I'm not familiar with it. Most Dr. Adler, you had a point. Uh, occasionally, they'll do a desk audit, um, which is more programmatic in nature than financial. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm not sure if this question falls in here or the how it the budget process. We'll jump up and call you out of order, don't worry. No, please, go ahead. Uh, but I wanted to kind of understand how the balancing of when services that are called for are, I guess it would be, excess costs. How was the determination made? What goes on behind the scenes? Way, whether we're going to provide these services on a contract basis, how long that's going to be, you know, versus we're trying to have someone in house deliver the services. Is that a kind of budget process thing? Is this tough later on the presentation or just the and I can make it a little bit more specific if that's a little bit too vague. May I respond? Please. Dr. Adler? Yes, sure. Just um, that's a little too driven. Um, the, the plan and placement team decide what services are going to be That's based on what goals they develop and what kind of group. And then we find out who's the best person in the So if there are staff in the house that are able to do that, we use the house staff. If they're not, we use resources and set them up on that provider that have a great use of them. It's based on the goals that are generated in that. Right. Right, but there is a push and pull between the and you know these are more expensive. How do we is going? If there's a limit on this, you can only contract out so much as I can tell you that this has been a conversation that we've got to be glad One last you should excuse me offline if that's a conversation that you have. I won't speak with another other families here. Um, uh, our practice is Services are developed based on goals. So, if we need a provider, for instance, if we need a teacher of hearing impaired because we don't have a teacher of hearing impaired, we contact that. If we need a teacher of vision impaired, we use BESB. If we need a provider who has a specific expertise in prompt therapy, we don't have that available, we use that. So, um, that's not our practice we're describing, but I'd be more than willing to meet with you. That's been your experience, and you're more than I think the way, I mean. Section 7474. <laughs> <laughs> In all honesty, for the budget process, we have to look at, okay, so what's our, our best estimate uh, moving forward for next year in terms of uh, the population that will receive in special services? What are those special services? Are we anticipating uh, any new additions? Are there children who are aging out, so to speak, out of the services? Um, to try and come as close as possible of putting that number into the budget and that that it's not just a made-up number, right? Um, clearly it's not. Um, so there are students behind each of those. We're always looking for ways to uh, have shared services, uh, transportation, or services in general. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, whatever we're putting in for excess costs in terms of special education needs, they're itemized by, by student services. Should we move on to the GAM report since we've already kind of touched on that? Um, if the, um, are there plans um, from the Board of Finance or the Board of Education, the district, to look back at the special education reports from, um, well, the reports, I guess, from 2013 to 15 and report on the progress and um, what we have and haven't accomplished, what we still can gain? So it, it's a good question. I've looked at it from the standpoint of whether, based on what I'm seeing and hearing, 
and that's both from talking to other town officials and Board of Education members uh, and even parents. <clears throat> Am I getting a sense that there's a serious deficiency with this, that we ought to take a look at it? And by, from, from my standpoint, the deficiency is whether there's a, a financial risk that involved as opposed to failure to deliver on prescribed services, which is sort of outside my purview. Based on everything that I've seen in terms of how the paperwork's being handled in the beginning to the very end, which is when the excess cost reimbursement is submitted to the state, as I said before, my sense is that the, the people and the processes that overlay and make all of that happen are dramatically improved from where they were at the time that we did that special education audit. So in my judgment right now, I don't think we need to do anything special or extra beyond what the district is doing and what Dr. Adley and Dr. Klein are doing to monitor all that. If I were to do something, it would be simply to call the auditors in and say, I'd like to create a, a almost a special provision in the audit that says, could you t please take a look at these processes and procedures? One thing that makes that challenging, of course, is that, and, and we discovered this as part of this audit, is that at some point you're going along and making these inquiries and looking at these processes, and to really get down to the point where you can say for sure that this, I, I have got complete confidence and this is fully validated, you've got to cross a line into individual student data, and that's a line we cannot cross. And so what you do instead is say, as a general matter, is there training so that the professionals who do have access to that data know what they're doing? Are the processes that they're following consistent with best practice and to the extent that it's prescribed by law, following those laws and regulations? And frankly, it gets back to my it takes a community point. Is anybody complaining, right? I mean, if, if I kind of get a sense, I mean, there's always going to be some noise. As I said before, there's no such thing as a Don't perfect system. Don't get them system. right up nice. <laughs> right. His name is Dr. Adley. Uh, Call him. Um, my point is, is that you never get to that kind of 100% solution where the entire parent community is completely silent because this is 100% is, is, is accurate. You never get there. And so what I've, I, I talk to a lot of people and I try to get a sense for that noise level. Is this stuff that is really parents playing their role to ver verify that services are being provided because they have to play that role and the way they play that role is they raise their hand and say, hey, this is not quite right. Uh, or is it something more systemic and more, uh, th therefore, has higher risk from a financial standpoint that we really need to take a look at? And uh, since I did all this five years ago, I've looked at this uh, uh, pretty regularly, if not constantly, for five years. And there's been a steady improvement, well, a quick improvement once this was done, uh, but a steady improvement since then. And I, I speak for a lot of people who provided that type of input for me. I don't see anything, any reason from a Board of Finance standpoint to, anything, to do anything more than what I'm talking about here. So. so that was the first report I read before I came here. And it's probably the report that I've read continually since I've been here, um, just to revisit it. And I can tell you I'm very impressed with the alignment of the practices to the actual recommendations are in that report. And actually, to be honest with you, this is a question probably for my board chair or board, board of education, um, because I don't, honestly, I don't see a need. I don't think that there's any intention of revisiting uh, this particular particular matter in terms of an audit sort of process. Um, so I'll be looking for direction from my board on that, but everything I see is that the practices and procedures are in place are aligning to those recommendations. That's very, very evident. Yeah, we also had to remember as a result of this audit, the town had a black mark as a result of mismanagement or, or inadequacies regarding these filings. And the state was well aware of that when all this became transparent. I'd remind everybody that we've had no further inquiries from the state. You'd think we'd be under a microscope. I have no visibility into how the state looks at these applications uh, since, since we've been filing them after this audit. But the fact that they have not come back to us and said that, look, these... Docu the documentation is inadequate, or we're hearing through our own inquiries that these procedures are inadequate. Uh, there's been not one word uh, from, from the state in that regard. So I think that's further validation that, in fact, the, uh, the these applications and the underlying paperwork and processes are, are being handled properly. Just while there's a wee pause, you'll forgive me if I just, I, I just want just expert initially a little bit just so I can know that the people on the ground are fabulous and the services are being delivered okay I'm, I'm assuming it's not perfect all the time are tremendous honestly um, the, 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 just an, there's a level of excellence that permeates this district and that applies to special education services too 
completely. Dedicated, hardworking, um, the things that you're looking for are to be in place, I think are in place. I think there's always room for improvement in, in any area of, of, of our district. But seeing it from my side of the desk, uh, I can look you now and say, look, listen, I'm not going for to get down to this lady and down to the department to continue to correct things. And yet we're always discussing how do we improve things. So it's not just like a free free for all, but um, you should just know that. It, it's, I'm hoping to some degree you do because you work you, you, you work with our staff, right? And your children work with our staff and I'm assuming that's why you're here, so but anyway. The pause is over, go ahead, Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Just to follow up on the last point, um, I'm new to town and I've been thirteen, my son's six years old. So I am here for any of the audit beforehand. Lucky you. I I can say that the services that we've had and the people that we've worked with have been terrific. So I I can understand tracking and where everybody's coming from, but just from someone who's never experienced any of that, I've only had really good experience and it's my question before is not that experience just trying to understand and push and pull things. So yes. Oh thank you. Well, thank we you. appreciate that. Thank you. Jamie, what else? Okay. Um so the next one is um, is there a plan to revise RC twenty four to support services uh, from special education? Um, will there be an in- income expense ana- uh, analysis for 504 services, general education, social and emotional supports, FITCH, ELP, basically breaking out the expenses. Um, I guess the bigger question is, is anything under RC24 um, designated for special education, or are we seeing some support services for general education under RC24? Oh, is that where the... Is that the impetus of the label of support services or versus special education? It's just, um, the way some districts categorize, just the broader category of support services instead of special education. So, I mean, it's just one. So, what can, can, I, can I ask, like, what's your concern about that? So, well, as you can imagine, special education yeah. in Darien yes, of has always had, like, sort of a special cachet, as you can imagine. Yeah. It's and just I guess, special. Um, <laughs> the, the impetus, I think, would be it would just more accurately reflect what would be included. So, because I think a lot of the mental health services for the district are all encompassed. So, for regular ed, for 504s, for Fitch, for ELP, all of those are all encompassed under that RC. So, it would just if we called it support services, we felt like it would be might be a better. I think that came up a few times during the budget season, not just by us. I think. And so I was, and I know um, Dr. Ali and here, but I think uh, just, I think it just, because during the, the budget season itself, it can't really get changed. And so I think we just thought it would be helpful to just <coughs> ask your thoughts on it at this point, because um, I think the idea that the growth of that area has been significant uh, when you think of just mental health in the last five sure. years. Um, and so I guess that that was just, you know, a big piece of that is just trying to really understand from a documentation standpoint um, if it either could be separated out or just more accurately reflecting that that RC as supporting all students. I do think, does not ELP get a separate RC, I think? Yeah. I think yes, it does. Right, but the, some of the support services for ELP are under RC 24, right? right aren't they? Yeah. So, so I think, it's not I think the honest answer is, for this year, no. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> not, right? Because I have to live this and get a sense of the very things that you're talking about when I'm in the budget meeting, which are happening right now. Um, those are the types of questions that we're asking uh, school psychologists what part of that is regular education, what part is perhaps special education. But I just have to live through that budget, that the whole budget season, the whole uh, budget compilation uh, designed just to understand that really, really fully. I mean, I hear it, I understand it, I know what you're talking about, but to say that, oh yeah, that'd be a good idea. Um, I don't know if the board would want to do that either. I mean, because many of these questions are board decisions. Um, but for me to, imp- to have an input into the board decision, I just, I just need to live through it, to be honest with you. That's not avoiding the question, it's just being honest. 
from where we sit for the Board of Finance, I mean, keep in mind our statutory authority over these Board of Education budgets is a yes or no at the highest level. Uh, we try to stay informed as those budgets are developed. We read through all the materials that are provided to us, but I don't have a point of view in terms of how it's allocated among the individual uh, accounting groups or RCs that the Board of Education specifies. <clears throat> My main thing is whether the accounting of the individual services fe is feeding up somehow, how it gets fed up and where it gets reported on individual forms, at least from where we sit, we're agnostic on that. Uh, so it'll be important for the Board of Education and even the administration in terms of how it manages and looks at reporting, uh, as Dr. Adley said, to let that evolve over the course of this cycle and let them decide since they're the ones who actually have to manage it. But your point's well taken. Would you ever consider adding and support services <laughs> just to more accurately reflect? In other words, you wouldn't really have to change anything but other than saying it, it, that the, the RC name is special education. Entity. Should she ask you in a year? She could. <laughs> it relates to the culture and the environment. And the, um, I guess in the past there's been a lot of pushback or at least separation of all of this is for the kids that receive special education. And really what Courtney is pointing out is it's typical kids facing problems that more and more you know, are happening in today's day and age. So it, we're just trying to get it to reflect for the whole population, for the town to understand. This is not children receiving that have any disabilities or learning challenges. This is this could be your typical child who's getting more counseling or family services is being called in. So it would be an, a, a more accurate reflection of what you're actually discussing. That's why we brought it up. Yes. There are scenarios and situations where people may report something under pupil services. It's another way of reporting to some degree. But we have to be very clear of what special services are because we, the ED101 oh, one needs to be special services, right? So we need to report those accurately. But we would. That wouldn't, they're not mutually exclusive ideas, basically. Stay tuned. I don't know. Well, and I think it also relates to when we get to the state of the town, which we've sort of had discussions with John before, but you can't talk about the tracking of special education by the special education numbers that are under RC24. It's the same idea. Those aren't just special education, so you can't. Um, well, you can. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we hope you won't. And so that's, that's where it comes into play also, I think. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the elephant in the room is, sorry for being plain spoken about this, but the elephant in the room is, is that people are feeling, there's a history in this town of parents of children with special needs um, feeling less than, okay? Because of some, of them, some of it around all the things that happened before Gam got here, some of it is a result of um, other people in government making public comments that were derogatory. There's a lot, a lot of bad things that happened. And it, and it still stings, I think, even even for someone like myself who very consciously chooses to move forward, okay? Having lived through that. Uh, the, the, so in that, I think Lynn is completely correct. What this is is we feel like we need to defend. It's not just, like, I understand. It's RC24, but it's, but, the way to defend our RC24, my first instinct is to say, well, it's not all special ed kids. I shouldn't have to defend that. So I think it's a bigger part of the conversation that we need to have in this town, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. And that is that all students, all students are individuals. It does not cost the same amount to educate every single student. There's an average, right? But if you have a child who's in, you know, involved in three sports, and you compare that to a child who's not involved in any sports, hmm, who are you spending more money on, right? If you have a kid who, maybe you have a kid who has special ed education services, and their services really aren't that much, right? But you have another kid whose parents are divorced or who's, you know, has a sibling who committed suicide, and they need a lot of support that year. It's okay. We're supposed to meet these kids where they are. It's supposed to be okay that we're different. And we, we are in a place where that is not okay. It is a much bigger conversation that needs to go on. 
then we can go on to night in the storm. But that's the feeling I think that is maybe the missing piece to what where you're trying to figure yes. out what the history is here. Um, we need to have a bigger conversation in our town about what, that it's okay to be different, that it's okay to be individual, that in fact we are all individuals. And and being different is not being being bad. So I think that's a I think I feel that in in this room. It's a familiar feeling. It's triggering me to be honest with you. But it just needs to be okay, and we just need, I think, some reassurance that we're not going to be boxed in. Like, oh, these are the kids. These are the kids that are costing all the money. Well, thank you for sharing. But I, I but, think that's what part of what's going on in the study. Um, well, I may be too new to to, to feel that. Each of I don't feel that. Um, but but you've been here longer than I've been here, so I respect that. <clears throat> I will tell you that. One of the things attracting me to the district is the advocacy for all children. Um, I have a wee soft spot for uh, marginalised students. I don't mind saying that, I do. Um, but that doesn't have to be special education students. That could be any student who needs help or needs assistance. And all our children are special. All our children learn differently. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't, it shouldn't be mutually exclusive to the discussion of just how we do do business together, right? And how we work together. Um, but I can tell you that this district advocates for all, all children, yes. I just want to follow up by saying I think it's important for everybody to be careful of their language and, and not sure. talking specifically to either one of you. But when we talk about children who have special needs, we talk about children who have special needs. Yes. We don't talk about special ed kids or special oh, kids or anything agreed. like that. We don't define the person by their age, right? So anybody who's here, who's you know in town, who has a, a voice where people are listening, please be careful with your language because we don't define people by their disabilities. Like we wouldn't define somebody by medical. Um, I know lots of people heard this, but wouldn't define someone by a medical diagnosis. You don't say cancer Sue, right? But but people say autistic Joe, right? So we don't. We have to be respectful in the way we talk to people, particularly around special education. Language is powerful, and I think that that is one thing that we can do that you both can do. Not that you're not, but because of that, we can hear other people. Speak about all children and speak about children first. Well, I so I have been so I have been at this a long time, um, and you can come after me my name anytime. So ha happy to take all of that. Um, and I've said things in the past that, frankly, uh, in retrospect, could have handled been handled differently on special education, and I've admitted that publicly, and I'll admit it again. In terms of the state of the town address for this year, I'm not going to mention anything like that. Uh, the words that I'm going to use are going to be uh, actually re reflecting some of the comments I've made tonight around these process improvements. Uh, but I'm also going to have an exhortation, just like I said, uh, this lady here in terms of her her comment that the way we get all this to work, and I think this comes off of some of the things Dr. Adley said, is it's a team effort, right? It's simply impossible for any paid staff member to get this exactly right. It's going to be a combination of parents <clears throat> hearing from their students, who then involve administration, who then work with government officials, whether they're on the Board of Education or on another board, and that collectively we actually get to not just a good answer on that, but a good sense in the community that we're treating everybody fairly on that dimension. Now that's something certainly I'm more attuned to now, and that's going to be reflective of all the comments that I make. Um, I'll never stop advocating for the taxpayer. I'll never stop being transparent on what things cost. But I can assure you that when I do talk about those things, they'll be managed and said in a way that's judicious and mindful of all that, because it actually does no good to highlight costs in a destructive way. It does very much good, I think, to highlight costs in an educational way so that everybody understands why we're spending money. Ultimately, as, as everyone in this room is a taxpayer in this town, you absolutely have to know that uh, for your own 
purposes and your own benefit, but at the same time, you should be able to look at the comments that were made to try to educate somebody on those matters and say, was that done in a way that brought the community together, that got everybody feeling good about why we're spending this money? We mean, I like to pay taxes, but are we feeling good about that? And are the people who are involved in receipt of those services feel like they're being treated fairly uh, and not highlighted in an unfair manner? So I take all that seriously, and I get it. Thank you for your comment. I appreciate that. I think we've uh, jumped ahead in the state of the town address, so we have that covered. <laughs> um, just uh, we'd like to touch on the strategic planning pro uh, process, um, which is a, 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 a question for uh, Dr. Adley. Um, we understand that you've recently um, picked a firm sure. to, um, and that's been approved by the Board of Education. So um, will there be targeted analysis within disability categories um, uh, for students receiving special education services? What, uh, how closely are you looking at outcomes is specifically what we're looking at? I'll let you come back to you later, sir. I just so you had a hand up right there. Okay, um, or, or, um, so clearly, uh, special education will be represented. I mean, uh, to commit to to what de degree in terms of representation for uh, for learning needs or otherwise. Um, I don't know that I can get into that level, to be honest with you. I'll have to see how the facilitator uh, deals with this. But this is a, special education is a big part of the budget. Special education is a big part of life here. Special education is services are integral to, what, to, to, to the work here that we do together. Um, so special education will be represented on that committee. I have no doubt about that. No doubt about that. But I want to, don't want to presuppose... Um, well, I'm, we need to have a parent with a student who has a learning disability and a parent who has a student who has other health impaired. And a I, I just want to presuppose that because I don't think they are mutually exclusive ideas anyway. I think people with special, people representing special services, I think it rec represents special services in general, for the most part. Um, but again, I just don't want to presuppose of how the facilitator is actually going to go about his work with that committee. But... I think it'll be clear that we're, there's definitely going to be uh, representation from special education, one one way or another. I don't know if I'm pointing or someone else is taking. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I have just a question about the question. <laughs> what are data outcomes that we're talking about, and how is it that they are measured? Well, I mean, this actually might be a question for Dr. Hadley. Um, how we're looking at the academic success of children, um, whether they uh, fall within a specific, um, the school has disability categories and specific medical categories, um, but I guess that was more specifically what I was talking so I think, again, uh, that's going to be the work of that strategic committee to decide what the metrics are and what the, what the data outcomes are. It's not up for me to say what those should look like, but that's why, in all honesty, you need a skilled facilitator to work with all of us. Um, so that, that will be up to the community to decide what are the metrics that we want to, to, to use here in measuring this um, and how do we convey those. So... I don't want to presuppose any any outcome, and there's been no outcome delineated. Uh, that's just going to be organic in nature. Could you maybe just a little bit more of the backdrop of your thinking in, in starting the process, the strategic planning process? Like, was it something you had done in other districts, or? Um... Oh, why did it do it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Board of Education has board goals. Right, so that has dictated the work for, for some time. And as coming in as a new superintendent, I don't want to presuppose okay, this is this is the next level of work for Dairy and Public Schools. That would be naive and it would be inappropriate. Uh, but I would like to enter into the process, I've recommended the board to enter into the process of doing some strategic planning. Um, there's a couple of forces that come together here to make it Okay, uh, this seems to be, I wouldn't say I would necessarily, I, I was coming in with a strategic plan, right, or a plan to do a plan. But 
on surveying kind of what's in place and the stage we're at uh, in terms of development and uh, things that are in place or maybe some things that are not in place. It just seemed to be a nice opportunity for the board to come together and decide what is the next level of work for the district. Um, because there's no major strategic guidance. Well, there, there's a philosophy, right? Um, but there's no major strategic roadmap for the next five or ten years, right? So this is a nice opportunity. The high school has to do the whole vision of the graduate. That's a requirement of their NEAS accreditation. So that's a nice opportunity to dovetail in what do we want our graduates to be and represent um, with this opportunity of board doing their, their board goal or their board plan and strategic plan with the community, right? So staff, community members, kids will all have the opportunity, businesses will all have the opportunity to direct this district for the next five to ten years through that plan. So the, the, the simple answer is, I think my professional judgment said it would it'd be a nice recommendation to the to board, um, given what's in place and what's not in place, and given just where we are in this time and place. Because I think it would be a unifying... Uh, the process may be just as important as the outcome of this thing in terms of engaging everybody together in the process and everybody having a voice in it. It will not be the superintendent saying what, what's happening, nor exclusively the board has to guide the process. And that's why the first step the, the uh, facilitator is going to do is to make sure we're okay with the process, right? Because I'm not pretending that this is the, the best process delineated by me. So the board will have a say in that too, right away. Do you agree with the process just to start with? Having been involved with or familiar with these things for a very long time, one of the great things about the town of Darien is that, let's say Dr. Adley was highly specific on exactly what he wanted for these questions. I'm pretty sure that parent groups and others are going to get involved anyway and make their voice heard. And <clears throat> exhibit A would be Pear Tree Point or the shuffle or uh, Oxridge Building Committee going on right now, all I assure you there is no shortage of not just random input, but very thoughtful input, good questions, hey, what about this, that type of thing. And sometimes it, it adds to the collective and sometimes it delays the project, right? So you can be confident that as any strategic plan, and I'm not involved in this, but I'm just saying, given what I've seen after all these years, there's going to be a lot of very thoughtful involvement and, and, and input to that process by a lot of people who are not involved in it. So, I, not, not to worry. <laughs> We should open it up because we pretty much shut. Does anyone else have questions? That we, it doesn't have to be regarding these um, topics that we've discussed, but we think they might go down. To, to John, um, you, you mentioned, uh, you phrased that, you know, I'm forgetting what it is now, but a while, um, financial, um, not liability, but. Darn, I, I apologize. I'm having a senior moment. That's right. I have them all the time. I'm very familiar with them. But what, what is the, in your view, what is the financial liability to the town, or the, the risk, if you will? What is the financial risk to the town? You mentioned, you used that phrase once or twice, and and I'm, I'm and I'll admit I'm sitting here with with, with a little bit of with, with a corporate lens, and with due respect to you, know, I don't I don't mean to to denigrate at all what you're doing. But I'm, I'm, You'd have to get in line anyway. It's a long wait. So. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm hearing, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect. You okay. know, with, with, and and that, I'm not, I try not to fall anyway. But there's, there's a line between the two functions here. Dr. Adley on the right hand is kind of in charge of delivering services. John, you're in charge of financial. Right? And they don't necessarily go together. And I know there was a lot of honest and, and upset a few years ago about. Mm -hmm. Um, access cost reimbursement, which has nothing to do per se with delivery of service. I think you all, you all mentioned that. So, and from my perspective, John, you as a financial guy come in and just sort of audit, right? And I think that's what we're hearing and seeing. And, and you per se don't necessarily, you shouldn't have to assume the role of checking, right? To make sure that, and, and you're saying that. Checking that the special ed services are delivered. Yeah, on this side, 
there's a feeling that maybe we should, or you should, and I, and I don't think they should, but I'm, but I'm feeling that a little bit that this can end. Um, this is leading to a question somewhere, but, but <laughs> what I'm hearing you saying is there's, there's financial risk, but really, what's the risk? Um, how big of a risk is there? Your job is to, and to the, you mentioned to the taxpayers and the community, your job is to do the audit. You're entitled to follow the, the kind of the standard accounting principles of the audit and so forth. You do that, your job is done, unless there's some big amount of fraud that's, that's blatant or obvious or something like that. Absent that, you probably don't. And I'm trying to figure out, so that's one piece. The second piece is the, the excess cost reimbursement here is so small, I think, relative to our budget, which is now 100 million, mm -hmm. right? So how much, I feel like we may be blowing your, your role out of proportion. Um, or maybe I'm wrong, and that's, that's why I'm asking, is it material? Is it half a million? Is it a million? Is it five million? Is it 10% of the budget? What's, what's the real risk here that you're mentioning? Well, let's see if I can dimensionalize it. We have a budget of about $145 million for the entire town, of which 100-ish is the schools, and 45 is sort of everything else, town, debt service, what have you. Um, when we did this audit back in 2014, and we we're looking back on the 2012-2013 school year, uh, if I'm recalling all this right in terms of these numbers, it's about $9.5 million in the total costs of the excess cost students, and then above that there was a threshold for reimbursement. But when they went through and they did all of these adjustments, and this is when we did abs we did nothing right, right? Certainly not the way it is today in terms of how they've sharpened up these processes. By the time you got through all of that, all of that, it was a $289,000 adjustment, okay? I would remind everybody that the audit at that time, uh, we had hoped that it would be in the thirty to $45,000 zip code, but by the time we got through it all and all the staff that had to be hired for this and the lengthy process that took, I, I can't even remember how long it took, it's sort of a blur, um, the final figure was somewhere between $100,000 and $120,000, right, versus a $289,000 mistake. So even when things were really bad, the financial cost of all those mistakes was quite small in the scheme of things. Not acceptable, certainly, uh, but, but quite small in the scheme of things. So when I say financial risk, I think on that particular point, for the total amount that, quote, could go wrong, I think that number is fairly small. I think there's a further risk just in terms of the, the reputation of the town, in terms of financial management. I think for us to have a second or third round with the state of them saying that this was done improperly, you could actually see them coming in uh, to us on other things where we have relationships with the state or we have responsibility for funding things to state san uh, standards. And so when I think about financial risk, <clears throat> there's a, a tip of the iceberg syndrome, if you will, that when I see something like this, I like to dip it in the bud, uh, particularly when it comes to dealings with the state, because anything that goes wrong there, it's just like the IRS agent finds one thing wrong, they're going to start to peel back the onion, and that's not something that you want to have happen. So for me, it's 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 several layers. One is just the financial risk of mistakes in these calculations, and then you can build from there in terms of damage to the town's reputation or other issues that might get surfaced uh, that, that, uh, that could create trouble for us. But you're quite right, just to round out your question, um, I don't have an interest or any responsibility for whether IEP services are delivered. My sole objective is to simply make sure that as all that is translated into something financial, which is a reimbursement from the state, that that's being handled uh, properly. And uh, that's where my focus is. So I, I would, like, I'm responsible for the complete oversight of this thing, ultimately, right? Um, as then the board is responsible for overseeing my oversight of it. Uh, so they have the, the responsibility of governance around all issues, including these financial issues. If I, if I could sort of like, this isn't an elephant in the room as well, but, but I just sort of like, it would be a bit disingenuous for me not to say this or or to note it, right? Um, sometimes the excess cost, which is not, okay, it's it's, it's significant, right? Two point million or whatever it happens to be at the minute, right? Um, or whatever whatever it's gonna be. But it's sort of indicative a wee bit, somewhat, of the size of the budget and the percentage of the budget that goes to special education needs, right? That's always a conundrum because where the rubber hits the road is the general budgets don't always increase about the same percentage, right? Um, so therefore, there's a, there's always this squeeze between 
general education, for the want of a better term, special education costs, right? Um, because the rising cost of special education, then the other services uh, struggle a little bit too, right? Um, that just is a wee conundrum because the, the, the budgets aren't going to be like astronomical. Um, so therefore, that's always a, it's just an, always a wee working conundrum. That's a sort of, to me, that's sort of like the wee indicator here a little bit um, that we just have to, to manage as best and as fiscally responsible for all students uh, as we can. But to say it's not like a wee dynamic, but it, we would not be recognized in that dynamic, to be honest with you. <clears throat> There's one other risk that I'll mention that is completely outside my purview, but that I worry about. Um, and it's a big reason why I agreed to, become, to come to this meeting. Uh, and that is that one of the ways I think you you build confidence in a program like this is not to have mistakes of this nature, right? So if you think about if you're a parent of a special education child, one of the ways that you start to get more comfortable is when public officials like me start to you know say the right things and, and, and exercise their their office properly. But beyond that is your confidence then the system that's actually providing services to your child. How do you get that confidence? Well, over an extended period of time, the services were delivered. My child got better. There's less tension or worry over all this. I feel very collaborative with all the people who are working with me. The process is going much more smoothly. So if you kind of think about that, if your participation in the system engenders those types of feelings and sentiments, that starts to be true across the community, right? And everybody starts to say, hey, well, it's not perfect, but this is a pretty good system. Look at the way they're handling it. These excess cost reimbursements are a piece of that puzzle, and if they're mishandled, it puts a chink in the armor. It makes people feel nervous that, wow, they're not really doing the right thing, or they're not paying attention to that. What are the implications for the services being delivered to my child if they can't count, right? So when I come in and say, look, I, I, I take this seriously, and I, I think this little piece is important and, and an important component of this. I'm actually talking about all the pieces writ large that all have to come together and work together to create in all of you confidence in this system. Because if you have that confidence, you're not sending your child to uh, an out-of-district placement. Why? Because you're confident that you can leave your child here. I'm confident in this system. These guys are doing the right thing. I don't need to send my child away, right? That takes years to build that confidence. It takes three seconds to destroy it. And so paying attention to these numbers, to a lot of the things that Dr. Adley's talking about, to every good question, particularly yours over here, where you say, hey, I'm not sure that these services are being delivered or I don't have proof of that. If we as a community take all that seriously, every day you do that, you layer in just a little bit more confidence, a little bit more trust, everybody feels a little bit better, such that if you do it right over a period of time and you very aggressively attack a mistake like this, right, you'll, you'll see it over time that you'll have a lot better system. And the system comes from trust and confidence in everybody involved, not just the people who provide it, but the parents and the students who are part of it. And that's why I took this meeting seriously and I wanted to come here tonight. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we know. It's okay. <laughs> We have all the time in the world. Um, <laughs> when we talk about the rising cost of special education, which I think you very rightly pointed out, cannot continue to grow at the percentage with which it has in the past. I'm always curious about, it, it, in terms of changing the curriculum, adopting more of like a BDL approach where everything is more um, differentiated for all students, is that something that brings the cost of special education down? Well, the, the, any time that we can meet the special, need, uh, special uh, needs requests of students in a classroom, in a, a regular classroom setting, the answer to that would be yes. I mean, that's in a sim very simplest terms, but it's much more complex than that, obviously. I guess I'd add to that, I, uh, your point that the percentage growth can't continue like that. I, I mean, as a finance and taxpayer guy, I'm not supposed to say this, but I think you got to set that aside and say, the first principle is the law requires that we identify students who have these issues and that we provide free and appropriate education for those students, period, full stop. That's what the law says. So the first thing we have to do is we have to make sure that we're following all, the, all that the law and the requirements of the rules demand, right? 
And then from there, based on our best ability to provide those services, there's a cost of X and it grows at Y percent over time. And the way you actually control those costs is you don't skimp on the services that were prescribed. You don't violate some, you don't do any of that. And by the way, if you can't figure out a way to deliver more efficiently and still meet those standards, I'm sorry, you're going to have dramatic percentage growth in special education service. You can't get away from that. I think what you have to do is say, for that, are we going to draw on the best people that we know, like Dr. Adley, to come in and, and Dr. Klein, to come in and provide a professional perspective about for the services that need to be provided at an excellent level to help these students become part of the community and grow, right? Here's a way that we could deliver those services more efficiently. And, that, and I would actually encourage parents to be part of that process and say, if there's a better way to skin a cat to actually deliver these things that make it less expensive, absolutely. As long as we meet the standards of delivering the services to those children, we're good. And for, for me, as long as that process has been followed, when I look at the percentage growth that comes out of that, what, what more do I have to say? Because I know that everybody involved, whether it's parents and students receiving services or the people trying to deliver them in a smart way, came together and this is their best answer. If you have that from a finance standpoint, I will be happy to pass that message on to taxpayers confident that it's the right number and the right thing to do. Yes, sir. The increase in the rising cost of delivering special education, what is that a function of? So currently, there, there, there are different aspects of what you just said. Uh, the numbers in special education over the last couple of years has increased, uh, and depending on the services that uh, students receive. I mean, it, 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 and our our enrollment is pretty steady right now, right? So that, that's that's a good thing. But but there are there are increasing increasing numbers of, of services, increasing number of students. Yeah, from a financial standpoint, as I've looked at this, it's a very complicated picture with a surprising number of moving parts, right? It's the personnel who are providing these services. It's the administration that's required to track the services. It's the third parties who provide services, whether they're contracted teaching services, transportation services, medical services. It could be out-of-district services. It could simply be construction or maintenance of physical facilities to provide services for these kids. I mean, it's, it's an endless list. And what you find is, is that with all those different components, with a, with a variety of students that come to the district that have special needs that change over time. Uh, I think we talked earlier a little bit about uh, some of these mental health issues that are much more serious now than they have been historically. Those are contributing to all that. So you have the, the moving parts that I described before and a changing nature of the problems that have to be addressed uh, within the law that I described. And it's a very complex picture. And so at some point you can look at the percentage increases and say, well, we have to do something. Or you can take the approach I mentioned before, which is, do we have people that we know, that we trust, that are the professionals who are on the service provision end of it, that are choreographing all these services with involved parents and their children on the receiving end of this, and those groups collaborating effectively. If they're doing that right, my hypothesis is that the percentage increases that come out, whereas they might be large, are something that we're in the aggregate comfortable with. Yes, ma'am. From a budget perspective, how do we sort out the differences between efforts around like early diagnosis and intervention more broadly versus the cost of more intensive remediation later? I'm thinking about this in the context of dyslexia, that being one of the most prevalent learning disabilities, and the differences, but it could be also mental health when we it earlier. So, so how do you separate the cost where sort of an earlier diagnosis diagnosis or intervention might be more um, less expensive, quite frankly, than letting things fester and have an intensive remediation. I've certainly seen that hand on example happen in our school district. How do you sort that out in a budget perspective? So getting money for things earlier on as opposed to treating it later is more expensive. Well I do think that the earlier the intervention the the, the better the opportunity you're gonna have as, as money well invested. Um, just a wee, a wee observation across the state of Connecticut there are more children having 
I'll just think all children, I won't say they're necessarily special education students, but there are more challenging students coming into primary school at the earliest age than ever before. And there's a variety of reasons for that, um, but that's an increase in dynamic that we're seeing uh, across the state. So much so that legislation's in place to, in some cases, like uh, if there's discipline problems, to take these kids out um, from teaching unions. I mean, it's it may impact that our most marginal marginalized students. Um, but the, the earlier we can in, uh, provide interventions, the better. We certainly do have uh, processes in place, and, and including. Uh, response to interventions, SRBI, um, most of you are probably familiar with that, and those interventions to get treatments to students and, and uh, at the level one or level two level uh, before we go into, into special education. That, and that was the design from the state to actually do that uh, so many years ago. So we have those processes in place, but any time that we can invest in early education, the better. Yeah, I'd offer my own wee observation. Sorry. I love it. I could listen to him all day. He's fantastic. Um, I wish to God that I had done this sooner with my own two children. Okay, So when they were young, I wasn't really educated on some of these things, and I didn't know what to look for. I mean, coming from my generation, when you didn't have all this sophistication, when we were kids, you could either do the work or you didn't. Nobody really thought about whether these were bigger exogenous issues that we needed to deal with, right? We were just very parochial and not sophisticated with that. And so I came into this with young kids not really having the perspective that I needed to ascertain for my own account, for my own family, as to whether some of this was a problem, right, and needed to be addressed. I just thought they were C students, right? What do I know, right? The reality is I should have been paying a lot closer attention to that. So when we think about this from a budget standpoint, I step outside my budget role and my exhortation to all parents in town is that you need to pay attention to this for your own account. I think it's easier in this day and age. People are just a lot more sophisticated and tuned in to this than, than certainly I was 10 or 15 years ago. But still, I think it's in, important and incumbent upon all parents to pay close attention to this and to the, in their own children and raise your hand. Say, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm concerned about this and start to get the school and then more broadly the district involved and they'll help you come in and, and ascertain what the right path forward is for your child if in fact there is a problem. In terms of the budget from where I sit, if all of that's done right, the budget number that Dr. Adley produces is the amalgamation of all of those micro-level decisions about what's being done with those children. Hopefully there's a lot of early intervention. I think I would agree to his point from my own experience. I get sample sizes of one, but my own experience is, yeah, it would have been a whole lot better if I'd done that. So I, I agree with you completely. Jill. Can I just add to Dr. Evans' point? There has been a, it's a good, important question. There has been a focus on our intervention. We've done anything from, Shirley, you pick up any point. Anything from, it really good. Anything from assessment tools like Ames Labs, so you can pick up learning, uh, excuse me, reading benchmarks at the earliest ages to training. You know, we built up the SRDI program, so I think a critical point, PLP, for example, this year, a grant to look at um, learning disability or reading disabilities specifically for children at that young age. So uh, you raise a critical point, yes, it has budgetary implications, and yet to John's point, it has educational implications. And we have made it a very good district to, to be looking at early intervention. So, surely, it's whatever I can say. You do just very much. That was right. Um, not only to take that in our state and state, and have the um, Board of Education to speak to this. We do have, um, with Martin Gillis, we have an um, early childhood ELP that we're really excited that we will be asking for next year or so. Um, and the board of some of our psychologists have to example of the material extension. They can show that we now have two psychologists in every elementary school. This is a real response to intervention. Um, they will be trained in response to classrooms, Dr. Ali was saying as well. Um, they're all being trained in DBT, which is an amazing resource that the board has been this year. Um, we've already implemented in secondary, and we just began um, this year, and we'll be next year. So I think we have a safe commitment to start with every year to know that not only is it best practice, but it's the best assurance that I think it will be successful. I think if you could also just another dimension, you got some tremendous programs in this district, DLC, ELP. I mean, they're just they're just tremendous, um, and the structures you have in place don't don't exist everywhere else. I'm just telling you, um, from the people who sit at PPTs and and 
the leadership levels that you have along uh, throughout the schools. I would also say that it's important to continue to invest in the professional learning of your staff. Those are not wasted dollars, right? Because you do it very, very strategically here and very, very well. Um, but as I said in some budget meetings about training for psychologists and different things, and saying, where's the money coming from for this, right? Um, I would actually just to keep an open mind to that because A, it's helping all kids. B, it might be actually an opportunity to uh, keep some expenses down in-house. Um, you can't have a, an organization where kids learn and adults don't. Uh, so it's important just in terms of when you see that, because you might see that come up a little bit in terms of uh, what's the professional uh, development budget, why do we have it like that, so on and so forth. Just, uh, I just think that's critically important. Other questions? I'd just like to conclude with one quick comment. Uh, one is to thank all of you for coming. It's a, a burden and a privilege to be the parent of a special education child. I know that from experience. Uh, but as we've talked about tonight, your involvement, not just with your child, but in forums like CPAC or even participating in a meeting like this, makes a huge difference. Uh, it's not just us asking questions. I've learned something by listening to everybody tonight. I'm sure Dr. Adley has as well. And so it's important to have this kind of participation. I just want to express my appreciation. My, my final comment is that I've been doing this for a long time. I've seen regular and interim superintendents, and I've had a chance to get to know Dr. Adley as part of this process. He sounds like this very nice man, and he is a very nice man, but I assure you, he is large and in charge, and he is a very impressive person, and we are quite lucky to have him as part of this town. I commend the Board of Education for their selection of this gentleman. And, and thank you for your support. Uh, as I got accustomed to the town here and to you, it's been delightful to, to be here, and uh, uh, I look forward to working very closely with you and together, so in the best interest of all our kids. Thank you for coming.